So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Indra Adnan from the Alternative UK, and I'm, today I'm interviewing Simon Anholt, who is the author of this great book that I've been reading. As you can see, uh, I've been reading it very carefully, called The Good Country Equation, How We Can Repair the World in One Generation. Uh, but Simon and I, in fact, have known each other for several years, and Simon has always been my go-to person for what I would call global entrepreneurship. How should we be looking at the globe really completely differently right now, all the time? Because without doing that, we won't be able to solve our global crises. So Simon um, describes himself as an independent policy advisor. However, as I said, I see him as a global uh, entrepreneur. He's the founder of the Good Country Index back in 2014. Um, and when that was launched, uh, I believe you did a TED talk and there was uh, 6 million views, um, I, which sort of suggests that there's a huge hunger for what you're doing. Um, but let, let's go back a bit, Simon. And what, I, what I'd like you to do, um, and, and what I'd like you to help our audience to understand is why you came to be acting in the global sphere um, and you know, why that is so important, but also how is it possible to act in the global sphere? Because most people would think, somehow that that's, that's out of their jurisdiction, that they cannot be actors in the global sphere. So I'm going to let you explain that history a little bit. And if you could take it back to, you know, what, where I know that, you're, you're, that you started in the, in the advertising industry, but you may want to take it back earlier than that and go as brief or as long as you'd like to. Thank you, Indra. Um, and, and thanks for the kind introduction. Um, I suppose most people assume that if you're going to the global dimension, it must necessarily be very theoretical. And the appeal of going to the very local dimension is that it can be very practical. And I suppose what I've spent quite a lot of my adult life, life trying to prove to myself and to others as well, is that you can be practical at the global level without necessarily being the Secretary General of the United Nations or the ruler of a country. So I guess that's my starting point. Um, I'm, I'm naturally interested in, in international. It's always been my taste. Um, it may have something to do with the fact that when I was little, we lived in several countries, that I myself am a bit of a mongrel and rather proud of it, made up of lots of different bits of the human species. Or maybe it's just a character trait, who knows? But I grew up convinced that other countries were always going to be more interesting than my own country. And that the people who lived in those countries would always be more interesting than the people who lived in my own country. And I assumed as one does as a child that everybody felt the same way. And it took many years before I began to realize actually that that's not quite the way it is. And an awful lot of people, perhaps most people for some reason assume that other countries are going to be less interesting than their own country and that the people who live in those countries are going to be less interesting than the people who live in their own country. So this theme of looking outwards and looking inwards, as I said in my TED talk, minds that microscope and minds that telescope, it sounds like a value judgment, but it really isn't. Those are just character traits. They're just ways that we're born seeing the world. And I've always been one of the ones that looks outwards. And so that's my taste. I wasn't interested in politics when I was younger. I found politics boring and actually secretly still do. Um, but I was very interested in the world and I also wanted to travel. I ended up going into the advertising industry after university, sort of by accident, mainly because my father told me not to and that was irresistible. Um, but mainly because I wanted to play with words and get paid for it. And being a copywriter seemed like the world's most perfect job. But then I quickly got demoted to being international creative coordinator when I admitted that I spoke some French and I was interested in other countries. Um, there was a kind of a reverse hierarchy in the big international agency where I first worked, where the people who did international were less important than the people who did domestic. And again, this was a pattern I found everywhere. To cut a very long story short, I became very interested in the whole question of the products that we were trying to sell for our clients, where those products were perceived to come from, and what impact that had on 
the brand images of those products. Uh, Levi's was American, and its Americanness was a very important part of its appeal. But it was the one part of its appeal that the Americans themselves didn't get. They couldn't see it, like fish swimming in water who don't know that they're in that particular medium. And I became interested in this topic, which I later discovered is called country of origin effect. It has been studied in marketing academia for decades. And it's a very interesting and very rich, although not enormous field. And uh, in about 1998, I wrote a paper in an academic journal called the Journal of Brand Management, believe it or not, there is such a thing, in which I um, pontificated about countries and the brands that came from those countries and how important that image was. And I looked at the case of, for example, Japan and Germany, two countries that are perceived to be enormously valuable in our modern age, but were perceived to be and were treated as complete pariahs uh, just a generation and a half ago. And how we will pay more money for a product that is perceived to be Japanese, even if it's got a fake Japanese name, just because it comes from the right country. And I thought to myself, gosh, imagine if you were an electronics company and you came from Guatemala, you'd have to pretend that you didn't come from Guatemala because nobody would buy your product. And to my astonishment, this paper created a bit of a ripple. Um, and I started getting asked to speak at conferences because people found this idea of nations having brand images rather spicy, rather provocative. I think it was as much at a word level as anything else, this great, noble, glorious word, nation, stuck uncomfortably onto this slippery, dodgy, modern word, brand. And the two things just jerk around under their own disagreement when you put them on the table. And uh, I started speaking at conferences and, and saying all kinds of wild things about how the world under globalization had turned into a gigantic supermarket and all the nations of the earth were nothing more than products on the shelves of that supermarket. And the governments were now brand managers as much as they were policy makers because they inherit when they come into office, the sacred responsibility of maintaining their country's good name, without which that country cannot prosper in the global environment. And there's a lot of obvious truth in all of that. Countries with very good, powerful, positive images trade at a premium. Everything is easy and everything is cheap if you've got a wonderful name, if you're Switzerland or, or, or Norway. The countries that have weak or negative images, whether deserved or not, trade at a discount whether they like it or not. And everything is difficult and everything is expensive and you're constantly having to explain to people who you are and why you're not as bad as they think. And the paper wasn't original it wasn't a proper academic paper i didn't quote anybody else i didn't do any proper research but as i say it did create some interest and it accidentally released this thing which turned out to be a kind of meme nation brand and i very quickly lost control of that as as you would and it turned into nation branding and i'll explain what those three letters mean Go yeah. ahead, Andrew. before before you go into the period of nation branding and the experiences you had with that, which I know um, we, we're going to move into, um, could you just describe what happened at your advertising agency and why it became, well, why you founded a new advertising agency and what was the thinking behind that? Mm. Um, well, originally I worked as a, as a copywriter at a, a very, very large international agency called McCann Erickson Worldwide. And I wanted to go and work for them because they had more offices in more countries than any other agency. And w when I was given this, uh, this, this job of international coordinator, that involved traveling round and round and round your international network, checking up to see whether we were doing the international campaigns properly. Uh, we had a lot of big American clients who wanted to run identical uh, promotions all over the world and it never seemed to work. And I became very interested in the, in the mechanisms behind that. Basically what we were doing was we were taking the American or very occasionally the British campaign, which the client loved and understood, um, and sending it to our offices in Jakarta or, 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 or uh, 
Tokyo or wherever it was, and having them translate it. And uh, it became deeply fascinating to me how badly that worked. Um, and of course, the, the point was that, um, well, there were two points really. One was that the creative people in the office in Jakarta or Tokyo didn't want to sit there translating the American office's work because they were creatives too. And they were, they'd been hired because they were good at coming up with new ideas of their own. And they saw translation as being a uh, little better than secretarial work. And they were very mortified by being asked to do it. But also they did it very poorly because they had the wrong mentality. Creative people work best from a blank sheet of paper. Translators work well from an existing piece of work, but a translator can't do advertising copy because it's a different skill. It's functional prose, it's purpose is to sell and to appeal um, and to engage. So, I mean, I could go on all day about this, but I, I wrote a book about it called the Another One Bites the Grass, which was a sort of canter through the uh, the complexities and the absurdities of trying to cross national and cultural boundaries with your language and with your humor and with your creativity and with your product and your brand and your business. Um, it's a book I'm enormously proud of even today. It's long out of print, but um, it's one of the very few books I've written that I can actually occasionally read bits of and quite enjoy because I find it such a fascinating subject. But anyway, so, Eventually, I, I, I left McCann Erickson and I started my own company, uh, which was eventually called World Writers. And a team of writers from uh, 20 and 40 countries. Um, and what we did was a thing we called simultaneous origination. I didn't show them the English because it, it messed with their mental processes and made them write things they would never normally write. And we just would go, we'd take the English or the American ad, we'd go back to the brief. I'd brief them to write what they would naturally write in, in, uh, in, in, in Japanese or, or, or German. <clears throat> and then we'd have the trouble of trying to persuade um, an upset mono, monolingual client who'd had it back translated into English, why it was so different and why it needed to be different and that that wasn't a mistake. Anyway, as I say, that, that whole topic area, um, well, it's a two hour interview in itself, but, but where it led me was, was useful. Yeah, and, and, and I just want to pick up that word that you use there, simultaneous origination, mm. um, which I haven't for one reason or another really picked up on before, but it says so much about the task that we have today. Mm. Um, even now, you know, even the best of do good, um, you know, transformative um, initiatives lack the real insight of the necessity of simultaneous origination. It has to look and feel as if it comes from the place where it is being lived, lived and, and grown. Yes. Yeah. I, I think that's right. And, and that can't be synthesized. You can't pretend it. You can't make it up. Culture is too deep, too rich, too complex, too vast. I remember at the time often using the metaphor of the iceberg that, um, People used to think that, that, that making communicative work cross boundaries was primarily a language problem, but it was really primarily a culture problem. And the iceberg showed you that at the tip you have language, but it, it, it hides beneath the water, the yeah, vast bulk, which is culture, yeah. which is almost imponderably complex. And uh, there are many people who speak other languages to a great level of mastery, but would be the first to admit that they are not bicultural. Um, so that's the that, that's the interesting thing. Yeah. I mean, I'm I am I'm not going to spend the two <laughs> the this hour on, on on this, but just give me just one sense of what it would be like to run an agency like that, where you had in the room at any given time all these different cultures and voices each each owning their own entry point and not trying to agree, you know, I suppose, but still having to find some sort of, you know, way to work together. Just anything you want to share about that? Well, I'm, I'm glad you asked that because, because it was an important learning for me. First of all, it was the best fun I'd ever had in my life. And I think I speak for most of us in the company when I say that. Um, we, we love every minute of it. 
because we were all natural cosmopolitans. We were all people who were excited and interested by other cultures and other languages by difference. And bringing all that difference together and merging it into a kind of polycultural soup was just the most exciting, but also more importantly, the most productive thing any of us had ever done. And there was a kind of accepted truth in the advertising industry back then in, in, in the 90s, and I'm sure it's still the same today, that doing creative work, coming up with original ideas and thoughts and messages was incredibly difficult. And you get very, very lean pickings from it. And the people who have to do creative work um, will spend hours and days um, beating their brains to come up with something original. At the end, they'll come up with one tiny little insight, which they will then frantically flog to the client. And, the f and I'd accepted this because that was the norm in advertising. You know, you do an awful lot of mining and come up with a tiny gem at the end of it. The moment I started working with creatives in the room because we started bringing them in as the company did better and better. They were originally freelancers. We began to discover that we were walking into this mine and coming out with armfuls of jewels and gold, more than we could possibly cope with. And it was at that point that it occurred to me that ideas are made of culture. And the more you stir up the cultural soup, the more ideas you'll get. And they may not be immediately usable. Sometimes they'll be very mysterious or very wrong um, or, or, or apparently um, incomprehensible, but, uh, and you have to do a lot of work afterwards to make, them use, make those ideas usable. But there's so much raw material there, you hardly know what to do with it. And I suppose that was the, the moment when the idea um, dawned on me that the most productive thing in the world is dapple. And dapple is a, is a word that I pinched from the Victorian poet, Gerard Manley Hopkins, who wrote a beautiful, beautiful poem called Pied Beauty. Um, and it's a, it's a hymn to diversity. Uh, for him, it's a, 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 at an aesthetic and religious level. He talks about the play of light and shade, what the Italians call chiaroscuro, and the, the, the sunlight coming down through leaves and making a dappled pattern. The play of colors on the skin of a trout in a, in a pool. And for him, that's a manifestation of divine power. But he loves and is um, inspired by splotchiness. Um, this is a lot like the Japanese aesthetic. The most beautiful koi carp is the one that's most irregular most splotchy. And it seems to me that this aesthetic is the diametric opposite of fascism. Fascism says that everything has to be clean and clear and black and white. And it applies also as far as fascism is concerned to genetics. If you get, um, for example, to use their example, blonde haired, blue eyed people to make babies together, you will eventually create a master race. But you only need um, uh, six weeks of basic biology to know that in fact the opposite is true. The more you stir up the gene pool, the more robust, the more resilient, the more effective, the more attractive it all becomes. And my own mixed nationality children are the daily proof of that. They become more and more intelligent and more and more beautiful with every generation that passes. Whereas um, um, not wishing to offend the Scandinavians, of course, because they're despite their common looks, quite a mixed gene pool. But if you really did do what Hitler wanted to do uh, and, and, and you get uh, a, um, a single genotype, within a couple of generations, they'll, they'll have spawned a race of weird looking goofs who can't count up to three. So in nature, as in aesthetics, as in politics, as in everything else, um, strength comes from diversity and purity is more closely associated with death than with life. So that kind of explains to me why I connected you, with you so easily. I think we were reading the same Gerard Manley Hopkins poem at the same time, probably. Yeah, um, and it makes very possibly. sense to me. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful that we managed to bring that to the surface here. But what happened next is the question, because there you were with your, you know, your insight into advertising, but you're clearly not going to be happy 
um, working working just through an advertising agency. And I'm going to go quickly back to this book and invite you into a little chapter now on um, helping people understand what you were doing for the next few years. Um, and if you read this book, you'll go, you'll understand that Simon went from uh, the Balkans to Botswana to the Faroe Islands to Iceland to Afghanistan to Russia. I mean, it, it, it was quite a journey you went on um, after after that period. So um, share a bit of it with, with us. I should probably explain before I do that 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 um, I wrote this book in a in a in a very particular way for a very particular reason. Um, it is a semi-comical, semi-tragical, autobiographical travelogue about the state of the world. Um, and the reason for that, as I explain in the preface, is because um, there are an awful lot of very, very good, uh, masterful, in fact, uh, books about the state of the world, and I choose that word carefully, um, which are, at least from, to my mind, almost unreadable, um, because they're so dense, and they're so well informed, and they're so technical, and they're so dry. And I thought, this is mad, because what we need is a book about the state of the world that anybody can read, and anybody can understand, and anybody can enjoy, because if they don't enjoy reading it, they'll never get to the end. So that's why I decided to make it autobiographical, because luckily, as it happens, the majority of my work has involved traveling to other countries, working with other governments, and the absurd appears to seek me out. Um, <laughs> most people who who travel for a living find this, that they just end up in, in bonkers situations one after another. And the stories were too good not to be told. Um, and I've been very lucky that as my uh, career developed, um, I ended up dealing with people at higher and higher and higher levels to the extent in the last 10 years, they've mostly been presidents, prime ministers and monarchs. And those people are really interesting. They're not necessarily better than people lower down the spectrum, but they're very interesting because they, ex they exercise so much power and that makes them quite interesting cases for all kinds of reasons. Anyway, so that's the way I wrote the book. Um, and and what, I did, what happened next was basically that I continued to run this company, World Writers, um, for, for, for another 10 years or so, and it, it was great and I loved it. But gradually as my job um, turned uh, less, further and further away from an entrepreneurial startup, and more and more into sort of the daily management of a growing team, I discovered that I was doing the wrong job and I didn't like it anymore. I'm hopeless as a manager. Um, I'm not nearly enough of, of, a, of a psychopath. That sounds awful, doesn't it? Uh, not all managers are psychopaths by any means, but you have to be rather good at just taking people and putting them in the position where they'll do best and I'm hopeless at that. So I, eventually I managed to get rid of the company. Um, and via a few other twists and turns, um, I decided that I was going to focus on this idea of country as brand. And uh, I was going to see if I could get to work with some real governments on it. And uh, the first one that turned up happened to be my own. Um, this was, we're, we're now talking about the turn of the century. And uh, Tony Blair, who was then the prime minister of the, of the UK, um, got very interested in this idea of the image of Britain. The government commissioned a study um, from Ipsos Mori um, called Through Other Eyes, um, which looked at the perceptions of Britain around the world and how and postulated how that might have an impact on Britain's ability to trade internationally now and in the future. And uh, because I'd written some stuff about this, I was invited to be part of the uh, original group in the, in the Foreign Office. Uh, looking at Britain's image abroad. And I stayed connected with that, that whole question, which has gone through many, many iterations uh, during, during the last 20 years, changes of name um, uh, and so forth. But it was still all fundamentally about the UK's soft power. And that's a term we'll no doubt come back to um, later on in the conversation. Um, and partly as a result of that, people started imagining uh, quite falsely that I was some kind of expert. Um, and inviting me to go and advise uh, them in other countries. And it started with, I think, Slovenia. Um, the British Council invited me to come and give a talk to the government of Slovenia about their image. Slovenia at the time wanted to join the European Union, and they feared, quite rightly, 
that the uh, somewhat negative overall image of the Balkans was going to make it very hard for them to persuade uh, public opinion in the European Union that they were Europeans and that they were fit to join the club. And so it went on. Lots and lots of um, almost all the work I've ever had with governments has been as a result of recommendations. Um, one country has fun talking about these things with me and passes me on to another one. Um, and partly as a result of that, an enormous number of the countries that I worked in during the first five or 10 years were from the ex-Soviet Union. And one of the points I make in the book is that it's very interesting that I learned a lot of what I know about propaganda from, from the ex-Soviet bloc um, and helping some of these countries to, uh, to understand different systems of, of governmental communication. But the important thing to say at this point, and, and it can't be stressed enough, is that almost from the very beginning, I began to regret the choice of that term, um, nation brand. Um, I simply, I, I meant something very simple by that. I just meant countries in the age of globalization have got images and those images are very important to them. They're a very precious asset and they therefore need to be measured and looked after. What I didn't say at the beginning was nation branding which is the way that the phrase eventually uh, turned out. And for many years, I used it myself without realizing the implication of those three letters. But basically, nation brand, as I say, was just an observation about the importance of, of reputation. Nation branding, on the other hand, sounds like a promise. It sounds like a promise to a government that says, if you don't like the image your country's got, and frankly, no country's like the image they've got, um, you can change it, you can manipulate it which is effectively saying you can manipulate international public opinion. You can use marketing communications, and it's a bit of a tragedy in the modern age that governments are in awe of the private sector and their devilish tricks. They think they're somehow better than the tricks of the public sector. Um, and, you know, if you can only get enough uh, taxpayers and donors' money to fling at the problem, uh, you can have an image like Nike's in six weeks. And it's all through the magic of branding, a term which nobody can explain, nobody can define, and which means, if it means anything at all, at least four things, quite different things. So um, I began to find that I was having to fight a rearguard action against this unfortunate term. And what I began to say to governments over and over and over again was, it's about what you do, it's not about what you say. Don't waste money on communications simply bragging about how wonderful you think your country is, is not going to make people think it's wonderful. What they believe about you, they probably believe since the day they were born, and they're not going to change it just because they see government propaganda telling them the opposite. Indeed, they may very well uh, re rebel uh, against being told what to believe by a foreign government. I do, I do just want to um, just hold there for a second, because I, I think this is a very important point to to expand just for a moment because I hear so much work right now going on around changing the narrative. I don't know if you're aware of this. A lot of I people are all the time. On, we need a new story. We need it. And I feel that exactly the same mistake is being made. This idea that we can just find a new story yes. and land it on the people or, you yes. know, or say, we're not this, we're this. But of course, if that isn't matched with new actions or some sort of evidence that that is the truth, um, it's not going to be any more effective than the, well, the original story, in fact, arose from the fact that it lands, yes. you know. Yes. And, and people also get confused for the same, exactly the same reason between the media and public opinion. They, assume, they believe that you can measure public opinion by monitoring the media, yes. but they're confusing inputs and outputs. Yes. The, the only way that you can cause people to believe something different is by changing the inputs. You can't simply model a better output because it, it doesn't fit onto anything. It doesn't, it has no receptor sites in the human mind. People can't concentrate on, on stories that are different from the ones they hear. And they certainly won't adopt them. I often think this is, this reminds me of um, those uh, weight reducing vibrating belt machines that they used to sell back in the eighties that you put a, you stand on this thing and, and you put a belt around you and you plug it in and it wobbles your flesh. And the idea is that it makes you thinner. And, and everybody knows that that doesn't work. Everybody knows that you can't reduce fat 
by operating on it from the outside. Massaging feels good, but it doesn't make the fat go anywhere. If you want the fat to go, you have to change the inputs. You have to eat less and exercise more. Um, and, and it's exactly the same thing with what people do. Now, now I know why you now I know why you were in advertising. I mean, that, I'm not going to forget that image in a hurry. Anyway. Um, images, images and metaphors are probably the only way to communicate with people in the modern age. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Well, I think that's how our brains are constructed, but let's not go down that rabbit hole. Um, we could be here for a day. Uh, give, just, if, 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 just give people a sense of, the, of your book, but also um, just any stories you want to share with us just for this period. Um, of, 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 of what was going on for you um, before we move into the next phase? Well, in, the, in these early days and the, and the countries that I was, um, that I was working with, I, <laughs> I was sort of going around with a, with a secret um, that I didn't want to admit. Um, and that was that I was actually learning far more than I was teaching. And it was a strange position for a a so-called consultant to be in. Um, I have to say, I, I, I don't feel too, too bad about it because I think that the, the way I was processing those learnings and the advice I was giving wasn't bad advice. I, it was, I was profoundly aware of the responsibility of my position. Not that these government officials were by any means stupid. I think they'd have realized immediately if what I'd been saying didn't make sense. They accepted what, what advice I gave because it did make sense and they're perfectly capable of deciding for themselves. Um, I also wasn't charging for it. I'm a very, very poor businessman and I forgot to charge for the first several years quite instinctively because I thought, well, if they're going to pay for me to get on a plane, as we used to do in those days, and go there and spend time with them and they're going to pay for me to stay in a hotel while I'm doing it, that's a gift. And I kind of forgot that I was supposed to be earning money for the first one or two. I'm not utterly stupid and did eventually start charging, but um, it was very, very, very small amounts of money. And I think that was partly because I'm such a, a bad business person, but partly also because I was very conscious of the fact that I was undergoing a very rapid apprenticeship. I didn't come from the public sector. I hadn't studied uh, politics or government or international relations. At university, I'd studied anthropology and linguistics which wasn't by any means useless uh, for what I was doing. The anthropology part was extremely useful, but I didn't know a thing about government administration or international relations. And one of the reasons why I, I quickly realized that this was the work that I wanted to do for the rest of my life was the fact that I was learning at such a rate and so many subjects that I began to realize were just profoundly interesting and made for me. International relations is a subject for which I've always had uh, enormous uh, respect. You truly need a brain the size of a planet to do international relations. It's like five dimensional chess. Um, and even now at the age of nearly 60, I only pretend to be able to do international relations. Um, it's so complex. The global system, the way that the behavior of one country ripples out and impacts in all kinds of, yeah, at some level predictable ways, but so complex that they're almost imponderable. Um, and I don't want to get personal here, but if you have um, a leader, a head of state or a head of government who doesn't understand that, and I'm thinking particularly of Donald Trump, who has probably a weaker than average understanding of international relations, you begin to realize the, the damage that such an individual can do to a very, very, very precarious system. Um, I think the idea of the international community was always an illusion anyway, but it sort of managed to persist for most of our lives in a kind of precarious balancing act that held together mainly through trust and illusion. And we'll come on to this, but one of the things that I think we're all realizing now is the tiny, tiny, tiny distance that separated us from total chaos. Uh, it was as thin as a cigarette paper. And it only took a few people just 
daring to challenge accepted norms and the whole system begins to unravel which is fucking brilliant and exactly what we needed explain that a bit more well it's probably easier if we if we talk about that again um nearer the end of the conversation but um it is brilliant because <laughs> Uh, somebody asked me yesterday, isn't this absolutely the wrong moment for you to be writing a book about international cooperation and collaboration just when extreme nationalism uh, is on the rise? And I said, no, this is exactly the right moment to be doing it because it's the only moment in recent history where anybody would listen. Um, the, and it's a word I dislike using, but just for the sake of brevity, the liberal uh, consensus was so steeped in complacency uh, that, that getting any of these arguments through would have been virtually impossible in any situation other than near panic. And now glorious near panic is finally beginning to emerge. Um, and that means that people are listening. And it also means that they've got some energy to spare. Great. And we're talking today. So let's, I, I know from, um, I don't want to leapfrog like you, cautioned me not to just now to the end but let's talk about the good country index and how that arose and it sounds to me from what you're describing that that was your response initially to this incredibly complex challenge of being able to be living you know in the world of international relations yeah I think that's right um, in order to explain the good country index, I have to go back to the nation brands index. Um, I won't spend long on it, hmm. but in around about 2004 or so, I began to realize that I was expressing a lot of opinions uh, also to the governments that I was advising about what kind of image their country had. And I suddenly realized that this was uh, irresponsible and, and unprofessional of me. Uh, because all I was really doing was giving them my opinion of their country and who am I? I'm just one of, 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 of seven billion people. Um, so I started looking for research on what people actually thought about other countries and I couldn't find it. I couldn't find anything international. So I teamed up with a company in, in Seattle um, and we started running this first um, initially quarterly, but then fairly quickly we went back to annual uh, international opinion poll measuring what 20,000 odd people around the world think about 50 different countries in great detail. And this uh, was called, still is called the Nation Brands Index. Today it's called the Anhalt Ipsos Nation Brands Index because uh, Ipsos uh, conduct the research for me. Um, it's a fascinating study. Uh, you can't um, glance at it without discovering something extraordinary about what the world, how the world sees the world. It's enormously rich. Um, I, I was just digging into it one day and suddenly thought to myself, I wonder what Muslims think about America. Uh, one of the demographic questions we ask in the study before we administer the questionnaire is what religion I, uh, do you associate yourself with? And so you can pull out all the Muslims, irrespective of which country they live in, and measure their perception of the American landscape or uh, the American government or American people or American products or whatever you want. And I discovered to my surprise that Muslims around the world admired then America more than any other self-declared religious group admires any other country. And this was fascinating because I was having a dialogue with the US State Department at the time, which was called, why do they hate us? And I was able to say to them, actually, they don't. And if you um, proceed on the assumption that they hate you, you're going to get everything wrong. Some of them do, a small number, but the vast majority don't, and don't forget that. Um, and so you can then start having a very productive conversation about who doesn't hate you and why, and what is it about you that they don't hate, and what are they expecting of you, and what are they needing of you, and how, does that match your behavior? Um, the idea of running a country in a way that's least partly demand-led is kind of revolutionary, uh, but kind of also massively overdue. So um, fast forward to 2014 or so, and uh, I discovered that the Nation Brands Index had collected a billion data points, and it was officially big data. Um, and I realized that I never ever had time 
to delve into this fascinating um, treasure trove of, of observations. So I decided I was going to take a year off <clears throat> and ask it some simple questions. I'm a rotten statistician and it ended up taking me two years and I made a horrible mess of it. Um, but luckily my friends at the University of East Anglia um, helped me and they know what they're doing. Um, and what came out of this observation at the end was an attempt to answer the simple question, why do people admire country A more than country B? And as I said before, this is important because country A, which is admired, gets more trade, more tourism, more foreign investment. It does better than the country which is less admired, B. So why? I knew it wasn't propaganda because I'd proved that that made no difference at all. There's no correlation between the amount of money governments spend on self-promotion and their image. In fact, it's a bit of a reverse correlation. The ones that spend too much money end up uh, making people annoyed and impatient. Um, and so what came out of it was a thing I called the Mars model, um, which was a model that, that uh, basically tried to find the drivers of a positive image. And there were five of them, M-A-R-S-S, -S, and some of them were hard power and some of them were relevance and so forth. But the one that was strongest by a wide margin was the M, morality, the perception that a country contributes something of value to the international community that it does some good in the world outside its own borders. This was by a wide margin, the most significant driver of a positive national reputation. And this was a revelation because it suddenly made me realize, well, so many things at once. First of all, that what I'd instinctively been telling governments for the previous 10 years was absolutely correct. You've, it's what you do, not what you say, but the kind of doing that works is doing good. Make yourself meaningful to people in other countries. Make them feel glad that you exist because of what you do for the human community and the planet that we share. And you will benefit as a, as a side benefit from a better image and therefore you will prosper. So suddenly I was able to go to governments with some confidence and say to them, look, do the right thing, cooperate more, collaborate more, uh, give more overseas development assistance, work better with the United Nations and the other international bodies, fight climate change and terrorism and modern day slavery and small arms proliferation and pollution and human rights abuses and all of these things because, not because it's the right thing to do and I'm expecting you to be moral or altruistic. A state cannot be moral or altruistic. It's a stupid idea. Do it because it's good for you. Because in the short term, not in the long term, I'm not talking about payback in a hundred years, in the short term, people will notice it and they will respect you more. And as a result of respecting you more, they will do business with you. That's the way it works. And of course, if that argument sounds familiar, it's because it is, it's corporate social responsibility all over again, but at this time at the level of the nation state. And why shouldn't it be so? Because it's the same quote unquote consumers operating the same decision-making mechanism on countries as they do on companies. So the same teenagers in Canada who refuse to buy a certain brand of running shoes because they don't like the way that company treats its workers in factories in Bangladesh also won't go on holiday to Poland because they don't like the Polish government's stance on gay rights or what have you. Um, this discovery changed my world because I suddenly thought, now I've got a lever I've got something more than just begging to go to governments with, to make them behave themselves. And ultimately that's why I wrote the book because the thinking by last year had matured to a stage where I thought, I'm, I'm, I, I'm no longer in danger of writing a book that simply says over and over again, wouldn't it be nice if everybody was nice? Or wouldn't it be lovely if everything was lovely? No, I'm actually in a position to write a book that says, this is how we're going to do it. Love that. I didn't answer your question about the Good Country Index. Shall it's I do fine. that quickly? Just, just keep going with the, because I, you know, the, the thing that I, as I said to you before, you know, I know what you've been doing. I just want you to share what you've been doing. And so that is, uh, that's the insight that I'm, um, I'm hoping will resonate. Um, but just answer a question for me. What's the difference between, but I mean, this ultimately is soft power, right? This is, this is the, the good story about the good country. 
in what ways is it not soft power or is it that soft power is now such an industry that it's defeated itself i have a pro i have a problem with the term itself um yeah. and 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 i should say that um uh Nobody admires Joseph Nye and his work um, more than I do. Well, that's an exaggeration. I admire Joseph Nye and his work very much. Mm. And, and I like him. I know him. Um, yeah. I, I just read his most recent book about American presidents, and I think it's extraordinary. It's a tour de force. Mm. But I think that uh, the concept of soft power, um, for me, is fundamentally flawed because it's still about power. And power is... Um, a conception of the relationship between nation states, which is the one which is one that we no longer need, we cannot use any longer, because ultimately, whether you're talking about hard power, shooting people, or soft power, hitting them with pillowcases, you're still talking about ways of achieving ascendancy over them. And it's that fundamental conception that the that statecraft is about achieving ascendancy over other states that is the thing we have to challenge. Ever since the Treaty of Westphalia, and in fact, millennia before that, the purpose of the state has been to achieve ascendancy over other states. And I see that um, there are three ages of humanity. The primitive one was conflict, which proceeded right up until Westphalia and still trickles along. The second one, which largely took over from that after Westphalia, was competition, which is a sort of commercial version of military conflict. And that is no longer serving us well. In fact, it's the reason why we're in the mess we're in today, fundamentally, because countries still behave like warring competing tribes and consequently never cooperate or collaborate consistently or imaginatively or regularly enough to make any progress against the grand challenges. Climate change, pandemics, self-evidently, are too big for any one country to solve. It's whack-a-mole. You know, even if uh, New Zealand is great at pandemics, they can't cure it because they need everybody to cure it. And the same applies to climate change, the same applies to narco trafficking, the same applies to all the existential challenges summarized in the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals uh, document. Therefore, self-evidently, the only way that humanity can prosper or even probably survive is if we change the culture of governance from fundamentally competitive to fundamentally collaborative. We have to collaborate first as an instinct and then compete afterwards. The auto industry has been doing this since the 1970s. There's no mystery to co-optition. It's just an experiment that's long overdue in the world of governance, in the world of politics, in the world of the public sector. Um, and, and the problem that with soft power and the problem with all talk in the public sector is that it's all still fundamentally about competition, which is just a proxy for conflict. And it has to change totally. Um, now, uh, don't get me wrong, I don't have a problem with competition. Competition is, is undoubtedly a part of human nature, a very important part of it. Competition undoubtedly has lifted billions of people out of poverty. It only becomes a problem when it's the only altar at which we worship, and that has been the rule for the last 80 years, and that's what must change. I talk about the need to change culture because I think it's more likely to happen than changing structures and systems. Um, you and I and many other people we know have wasted many a happy hour over the past decades positing how we might change the international systems and structures to make the world work better. And we could sit down for an hour and we could design a wonderful democratic global parliament. Um, God forbid, anybody who's seen the United Nations close up knows that any concentration of global power is bad news. Um, but that's a whole other conversation. Uh, the problem with all of these conversations, no matter how beautiful the output, is that nobody and no one and nothing has the authority to impose it. So it's simply a waste of time. At that supranational level, there is no authority. And so we could design this beautiful thing and, and go into the street and say, yay, we should be doing this and it won't happen. It's like what we were saying before about, about changing the narrative. When change happens, when systems and structures change, we look at the League of Nations, the creation of the League of Nations, the creation of the United, the creation of the United Nations and other institutions and other big structural changes that have taken place. They always occur as a result of the change in culture. When the culture changes and the thinking changes, the systems have to adapt. It doesn't require any authority for that to occur. It must occur because otherwise things fall apart. 
And so that's why I insist on the need to change culture. And culture can be changed. It's a vast task, but it can happen. Right. I mean, just as an apology to anyone listening who thought that we were going to finish in an hour, we're clearly not finishing in an hour. <laughs> but we'll, we'll, we'll keep trucking on until we get to, um, to, to the points that we need to get across. Um, but each one that you're raising really deserves a, 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 a more intensive look. I'm just going to ask you very briefly, um, when I think about a change of culture, I think about evolution, we are changing. And I think that's almost like a belief that I have, that we are constantly evolving. How do you see a change of culture and how would it show up? It's such a big question. I mean, we agree on this. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, one of the reasons why I'm so optimistic at this particular moment uh, is because like you, I see that culture changing. Mm -hmm. I see it changing amongst adults and I see it changing amongst children. And it's amongst the children where of course, one cannot but feel positive. Mm -hmm. um, most children, uh, most children um, grow up that are growing up today and have been growing up in the age of advanced globalization, uh, find a lot of this uh, microscope thinking, this nationalism, with which, by the way, I have great sympathy, I have to say. I don't see nationalism as an inherently a problem. If we had another couple of hours, we could, we could go on to that. Mm -hmm. um, but let's park that for a second. Um, they don't understand what all that is about. They don't understand what's the big deal if somebody comes from another country. Greta Thunberg is a wonderful example of the power of education to breed a generation of children who run towards the global challenges instead of running away from them, which is what sadly our generation and previous ones have done. So in a very practical sense, if you want to change the culture, you can do it in one generation through education. And that's why the subtitle of the book is very explicitly how we can repair the world in one generation. It's not an exaggeration and it's not a fantasy. Of course you can do that if there is a global agreement on what the educational uh, virtues and values and content and context should be. So one of the things I, I, I call for, and it's the project I'm busiest working on at the moment, uh, is something that I announced um, at the EAIE uh, summit in Helsinki uh, last year. It's a project called the, the, called the Good Generation, which is a call for a global compact on the educational values and virtues, which we all in the whole world agree we want to be fed into the educational systems in every country on earth, so that we bring up that generation who know how to deal with the world that they're, um, they're entering. Um, anybody who doubts that it's possible to get global agreement, and I'm talking about a big online AI mediated conversation between everybody in the world who wants to participate, but at an absolute minimum, one person from every country on earth. Um, anybody who doubts that humanity can agree on something as sensitive and fundamental as the education of their children, I would recommend they take another look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, or indeed the UN Charter because those are, as I say in the book, amongst the finest achievements of humanity. And they prove beyond doubt that when we really need to agree, even on super sensitive topics, and I think human rights is even more sensitive than the education of children, we can do it. We're not thick and we're not hopeless and I'm not giving up on us anything like yet. Um, so the, the getting to this global compact is, is the thing that I'm working on uh, at the moment. And it's thrilling because uh, I haven't met anybody who doesn't think it's a good idea. Um, <laughs> and the idea is that, you know, in a year or two, we'll have at least 100 ministers of education floating into St. Mark's Square in Venice on their gondolas to sign um, this uh, compact on uh, educational values. And then in one generation, which maybe we've just about got. You see, we're, we're too impatient. Uh, I, this idea came to me because I was looking at a lot of NGO websites and they were all in their different ways saying we've got to save the world. And so many of them used this phrase or something very like it. And we must leave the world in a better state for our children. And I suddenly thought, how arrogant is that, you know, that you can take a, a, a huge systemic problem like, like climate change or human rights violations uh, 
that have taken the omissions and commissions of billions of people, centuries to perpetrate, and you're going to fix it before you check out? I mean, come on, <laughs> you know, if you, if you want to change the world, you have to change humanity. Um, but that's not the impossible task that it sounds like. And of course, the young people influence the older people. So the, I'm not giving up on the, on the older generation. I just know how hard it is to change the minds and the behaviors of adults. Because once we pass 28, we become immutable, most of us. And actually, this is the only, only, only thing that really worries me at the moment. The only thing. I'm really, really worried by the fact that humanity seems to have lost the ability to change its mind. And if you can't change your mind, we're fucked. Um, well, okay, I'm, we, we could go down another, and like maybe this will have to be a series of uh, interviews, but, yeah. you know, I, uh, obviously my proposition is that we may well be moving into an age where the idea that you have to control your own mind is coming, you know, and that we can't really talk about humanity as, as, as a block anymore, that we're really moving into uh, responsibility for the self and for the mind. Um, but that's, I am actually going to put us, <laughs> we'll have to stop that, that particular conversation there because I don't want to not move into um, how the Good Country Index came about and then how it works. And we probably will have to go fairly rapidly into the present moment because um, I think at, at least I will say, um, having failed to... Um, capture everything in, uh, uh, this is my failure, uh, within the hour. Even so, I think that every part of your argument is still pointing to the solution. Um, and and, and none, none of what you've been doing over the years hasn't always, in a sense, sensed this need for this thing that can now be heard in a new way, as you're, as you're rightly saying. So please, canter on. Okay. Um, thank you, Indra. Well, the, the Good Country Index, very simply, um, is the first and still the only uh, indicator country ranking out there that instead of measuring how countries perform internally, separately on one dimension or another, this is the only one that measures their external impact. So what it attempts to do, and I underline attempts because it's a very, very difficult, if not impossible task to do it completely, it tries to measure what each country gives to the world outside its borders, to the planet and the rest of humanity, um, and what it takes away, a sort of balance sheet for the world, if you like. Um, it, it is an index which completely excludes all domestic factors. So I'm just not interested in what goes on. Well, of course, I'm interested, but for the purposes of this indicator, I don't include measurements of what countries do to their own people or even to their own environment, because that's so well measured in so many other places. It's not because I think it's unimportant. It's just because there's no point in measuring it again. But what hasn't been measured is the external impact. And in our age of massive interdependency, this is surely something that we need to know. I'm actually in the middle of a really interesting uh, conversation with the uh, United Nations Development Program who publish the Human Development Report. The Human Development Index is the go-to report looking at levels of uh, human development around the world, particularly in the emerging world. And we're talking about maybe looking at a now uh, three-dimensional model of development, which looks at how do you treat your own people and how do they fare and how do you treat your own environment and how does it fare and outside the sphere of your own country, how do you impact the uh, territories and the people of other states? This all stems from a, from a, a concept which for the, for the sake of brevity, I call the, the dual mandate. And, and my argument basically says that up until fairly recently in history, people in positions of power and authority had a very simple single mandate. They were responsible for their own people and their own slice of territory. And that applies to corporations and other institutions as much as it does to countries, cities, regions, and, and what have you. My argument is today, because of the situation that we find ourselves in, all people in positions of power and responsibility now have a dual mandate. They are responsible for their own people, yes, but also for every man, woman, child and animal on the planet, whether they like it or not. They are responsible for their own slice of territory, yes, but also for every square inch of the Earth's surface, the atmosphere above it, the soil beneath it, whether they like it or not. And if they don't like it, they shouldn't be in a position of power or responsibility. Now, 
I say to some extent, because obviously I'm not saying to the same extent, you know, the person, the person who runs Kiribati um, is, uh, is not as responsible for every human being on the planet as they are for their own people. Uh, you know, I, when Donald Trump says America first, I'm not scandalized or surprised or even very interested in that. It's a statement of the bleeding obvious, isn't it? I mean, if you're elected to run a country, of course you put the interests of that country first. What I dispute about Trump's apparent position on this is that that needs to mean that every other country comes last. And that's, in a sense, the tragedy of the Trump administration, that America of all countries has been the one that in modern history has probably done most to try and ensure that it comes first and by, or by means of assisting other countries to try and come first equal or at least second as well. Um, and this is the kind of thinking that we need. So the Good Country Index enables you at a glance um, to see the best available global data. It's mostly connected, collected by the UN system. Some people object to that, but frankly, the UN is the only organization big enough to measure what 150 countries are actually doing using, incidentally, those countries' local statistical offices. So it's not as if the UN in New York invent this data. It's collected on the ground by governments. In, for the most part. Um, to take one glance at this and say, uh, does this country give more than it takes? Is it a contributor to humanity and the planet outside its own borders, or is it a free rider on the global community? The opposite of a good country is not a bad country. Um, I mean good the opposite of selfish. I don't mean good the opposite of bad. These are not, in the obvious sense, moral judgments. They are, as far as it's possible to, 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 to be so, uh, practical measurements um, that enable people to make that call for themselves. If you happen to think that emitting CO2 um, is perhaps less of a crime against humanity than killing people, which I think I probably would, then you need to move the sliders up and down yourself and say, well, from this point of view, this is a, 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 a more selfish country because they kill more people than they emit CO2. And you also need to compare it with the internal measurements. The fact that they are so busy killing their own population that they've got no time left to kill other populations. Well, that's not necessarily a good thing. The two things have to be considered alongside each other, which is one of the reasons for the cooperation and the collaboration with the Human Development Index. Um, but that's the Good Country Index. It has proved um, a sort of funny mixture of rather predictable and astonishingly provocative and very unexpected indeed. So very unexpected indeed was the result that, for example, in the first edition in 2014, relative to the size of its economy, Ireland was the country that gave most to the world outside its borders. And it's nearly always in the, in the top, uh, top 10 or 20. Um, equally surprising uh, was the fact that Kenya, despite having a very small economy, um, managed to rank in the top 30. This was a result that was particularly pleasing to me because it shows that we're not measuring money. Um, we're not pursuing that tired old uh, Victorian philanthropy narrative that says all the problems in the world can be summed up by the fact that there are too many dollars above the equator and not enough dollars below it. And if only we could transfer enough spare dollars from above the line to below the line, all the problems would be solved. There's so much wrong with that assumption that one hardly needs knows where to begin. But I do think it's particularly important to remember the old African saying that says the hand that receives is beneath the hand that gives. And for as long as we frame all development or progress work as aid, we are stuck in a colonial mindset, um, perhaps to the financial benefit of the victims of colonialism, but we cannot progress until and unless we get beyond that. As far as I'm concerned, all nation states, indeed all territories, are equally responsible for managing the planet and managing humanity. And until we get to the stage where equal responsibility is accepted by everybody, and perhaps that means spending more time redressing the injustices, perhaps it does. But until we get to that stage, we cannot have a future. We cannot move forward. We cannot escape from the past. Can I just um, uh, sort of reflect back to how easily that could be misunderstood by people? So just to give you a chance to, 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 to hit any points that... Um, so you're, you're, you're not saying that um, it doesn't make any difference that people don't have material strength at all. Sure. Um, 
when you're talking about responsibility, some people would say, yes, but if you don't have any material well-being, you aren't able to respond. Mm. But I think what you're saying is that that, that, that example that you gave shows that um, culturally, creatively, imaginatively, people are always able to, yes. and that they are doing so, and that we should take much more notice of yes. what people are doing to rebalance the inputs into what we imagine international relations are. Is yes, that, is that, yeah. yeah, exactly. And, and thank you for helping me there. You're, you're absolutely right. Um, and, and the other thing that I don't mean to imply when I say these things is that in some sense, it's not a problem if a country suffers from, uh, from, from weak development or is at an early stage of development. Of course, it's a problem. But that's not what I'm focusing on because so many other people much better qualified than I are focusing on that. What I'm interested in is the necessity for all countries, rich or poor, to begin to change the culture of government such that they see themselves as equal participants and contributors to this thing called the international community. Mm. Um, and one of, the, one of the ideas which I most vigorously dispute is the idea that countries have to sort themselves out before they can sort out anything else. Mm. A lot of people say to me, for example, yes, but the countries at the bottom of your index are there because they're desperately poor and you can't blame them for spending all their time and money and effort on trying to sort out their own problems before they start worrying about the rest of the world. It's precisely that attitude that you have to get yourself sorted out before you can worry about the rest of the system that has got us into the mess we're in now. Experience shows that that point where a country decides it's rich enough or stable enough or prosperous or peaceful enough to start worrying about the rest of the world never happens because no country ever thinks it's got to that stage. You go to the richest, poshest, stablest, most peaceful countries on earth, God knows there aren't very many of them left, and you talk to their governments for five minutes, all they will talk about is national progress, GDP, uh, productivity, growth of the economy. They will only talk about the rest of the world when you force them, and it's an afterthought. This is the problem. So one of the things I'm, I've aimed to prove with the Good Country Index by measuring primarily non-financial uh, contributions to the to the to the global system um, is that it is absolutely possible, but not just possible, advantageous for very poor countries to start engaging more productively and imaginatively with the international community right away because it will help their development. It's not a thing you wait before you're able to afford to do because it's not about giving money. Yeah, and to some extent, the the, the ability of smaller countries to do that. Um, is cultural, meaning yes. that they would see themselves as, um, as, as core to their own worldview. So, for example, you know, your experience in Bhutan yeah. um, ended up being very influential, even though it's a tiny country, because it fancied itself as having something to say yeah. that was uh, connecting itself globally. Um, and it said it with conviction. You know, yes. in other countries, if there's too much of a sort of a hierarchical view internally mm -hmm. of what, where you sit, mm -hmm. you'll find it hard to express your creativity and your values and so on, because yes. you are feeling unheard to start with. And so yes. you'll never invest in that thing. So I'm just drawing out a little bit more of what I know, having read all your stories, that, you, that you've exemplified and exemplified. Although, although I have to... to, to be annoying there and, and jump on your uh, on your choice of words because you said Bhutan and we're talking about gross national happiness here yeah. has something to say right um, and the the point about sure, gross sure, national sure, happiness sure. was yes. that they never said it they yes. just did it yeah um, and we say it we say it because we're amplifying what we they say do. it because yes. we've seen it um, yeah. and yeah. we talk about it to each other Fair enough. Um, and, and you know as we both very well know this is not about your narrative um, this is about your gift to the world. And the questions that I've always encouraged governments to ask themselves are, are questions like that. What is our gift to the world? Um, there's a little anecdote in the book where I first met Felipe Calderon, the president of Mexico, when I was working there. And the, almost the first question he asked me was, Simon, how will we know if this works? And I couldn't think for the life of me for, for, for a sensible answer. 
uh, until the next morning. And so I had to go back and try it out on him, which was imagine a random person, let's say a 13 year old girl in Tajikistan or a retired shopkeeper in Australia. Success means that in the last 10 seconds before they drift off to sleep at night, they find themselves saying, thank God Mexico exists. <laughs> and that's our measure of success. Somewhere between, and the continuum is somewhere between two random people feeling grateful that Mexico exists and, and 7 billion or 8 billion people feeling that. 8 billion people fe feeling that before they go to bed at night is 100% success. Uh, <laughs> somewhere along that line is where we need to be. Yeah. Um, that's success. That means you're doing something. That means you're earning your place on the planet. That means that your people will feel proud of where they come from. That means that you are engaging effectively and imaginative with the, with the international community. Yeah. It means that your place on the planet is assured. And it also means you're going to get more money. Yeah. And that is, in a way, other people's responsibility. Because even, even listening to this video, people will now be thinking about Bhutan, or they may be thinking about, and they are, for example, thinking about Costa Rica, or they're thinking about, um, you know, you know, many places, they might, they might even be thinking about Devon, you know, or they, they'll, they'll be thinking actively about the things they heard that people are doing. Yes. And as they're doing that, they're building actually, in fact, a new narrative yes. and a new story about us as a globe of diverse, but, you know, incredibly ingenious actors yes. coming from surprising places. And this is, um, perception, isn't it? As we perceive, we are building this new narrative. Quite right. But <laughs> what I note over and over and over again when I hear people engaging in this new narrative is that at some level, there's still not enough clear water between being super cool and super effective and imaginative and daring about what you're doing and bragging about it and hoping that you will be a sort of model for other people and actually doing things for other people. Um, and in the book, uh, at a certain point, I, I posit the idea that there might be a six stage model of good placeness mm. um, that starts from the base level <clears throat> where you're basically pretty much unaware of what else is going on anywhere and you don't care. All the way up to the top where you are actively engaging in policy challenges with the widest possible selection of diverse actors that you can find anywhere in the world and collectively adopting those solutions. <clears throat> and again, yet again, you're not doing that because it's morally right or, or because it's the right on thing to do in 2020. You're doing it because it produces better results for everybody. Um, there's this, uh, this awful phrase that, that, I, that I use in the book, entrepreneurial multilateralism. It's almost as impossible to say as it is to spell. But the idea behind it is actually very simple. The idea is that you don't wait for the United Nations to launch the SDGs and reluctantly um, sign up to that. What you do is, if you're a Briton and you've got a policy challenge, like, I don't know, nurses pay in the Northeast, you don't just get a, br a bunch of public health experts and policymakers from Britain, sure, and your communities sitting in a room trying to fix it because by definition, they won't come up with anything new. What you do is you reach out randomly to other places. Um, the recommendation I made to the president of Sierra Leone is that when they were trying to tackle some of their poverty issues, they should put together a, a random club of places that began with the same initial letters. <laughs> so it should be Sierra Leone, Sri Lanka, St. Lucia, St. Louis, and South London, <laughs> right? Um, and there's a reason for that, because there's a magic in randomness. And uh, it, it, this is Edward de Bono. It's lateral thinking. The more you disrupt the normal patterns of logical thought, the more likely you are to come up with innovative stuff. So Devon and Bhutan uh, and the island of women in Mexico should absolutely get together with Britain to discuss, his, discuss nurses' pay in the Northeast. Because just like my experience back in the 1990s at World Writers, they will find that all of that diversity, that polycultural soup, will bring better, newer, more radical ideas than anybody's ever thought of before. And that's one of the reasons why globalization is the best thing that's ever happened. 
it's been horrendously mishandled. It's been allowed to run riot over the liberties and livelihoods of far too many people. Governments should be disgraced forever because of how they've allowed the corporate globalization agenda to dominate the social globalization agenda. But still, globalization is not something we choose. It's not something we can delete or reverse very effectively. Globalization is an instinct of human nature. Ever since we, we, we walked out of Africa, tens of thousands of years ago and stopped being a single tribe facing the same challenges, we have been, the story of humanity, the story of human innovation has been an attempt to try to get back together again. And now we've done it. We are virtually now, virtually, a single tribe facing the same challenges because we've caused them all ourselves. Of course, they're the same challenges. And that's why we shouldn't allow the idea of globalization to be the baby that goes out with the bathwater. We can't stop it and we shouldn't knock it. We should knock the way it's been allowed to happen. We should knock the way that it hasn't been properly managed, but we shouldn't throw it out because one of the things it brings us is the richest source of innovation, creativity, ingenuity, courage, and imagination, the things that we need most at this point in human history that human, humanity has ever had at its, at its fingertips. It's the solution as well as the problem. There's something about the way you just spoke that makes me tempted to finish here because I feel as if you've said what needs to be said and that you're giving us the right challenge at the right moment. But I'll, I'll let you agree with me if there's anything else that you feel needs to be said before we close this, and it may only be the first of many. Um, I'll hand that back to you. Um. Yeah, I think I too, um, in that last comment, was tr tr I, I was also trying to draw, draw it to, to a bit of a close. There's one thing that I would add, only because it doesn't quite fit, so it's mm. not a triumphant ending, but it seems to me to be very important. Mm. The Good Country Equation is, I think, probably the first of a, of a trilogy of books. The fundamental issue is the one that we almost started with, which is that we need, what humanity needs today is a change in the culture of government, governance right across the board from fundamentally competitive to fundamentally collaborative. Um, in order to achieve that, we have to look at who has the most influence over human behavior. And I started with governments and countries because that's been my work for most of my career. And that was the natural place to start. The second book, I think we'll probably look at corporations because they govern <coughs> influence, let's say, impact the lives of just as many people as governments do, and in many ways more effectively in the modern age, but also with fewer checks and balances. So that's an interesting one. And the third one probably has to be religions and philosophies. Um, and that's one that I won't even attempt to start writing until I'm a lot nearer 70, um, because it will need more wisdom than I currently have. But that that's, that's the triple part. And, um, that wasn't the thing that I wanted to add. Here's the thing I wanted to add. The idea has emerged um, in the last few years that there is a subspecies of humanity called a globalist, of which I am evidently one, because I spend a lot of time thinking about these fairly sort of um, big numbers and high level issues. And that there's another subspecies called localists who care about the tiny community in which they live. The idea has emerged in the last few years that those two tribes are tribes and they're enemies and that they should spend all of their free time screaming hatred at each other on social media. This is the most dangerous idea in the world at the moment. And it's bullshit. Almost all of us are both to some degree. Yes, I happen to spend most of my waking hours worrying about the planet because I have that particular kind of hubris but I also worry enormously about the tiny village in which I live. I'm far too busy worrying about the planet to spend nearly enough time on the tiny village. And I'm really glad that there are lots of localists here who spend more time than I do on the village. We all are both and we all must do both and we all must collaborate and cooperate. Otherwise, surely, what was it Benjamin Franklin said? We must, we must hang together or assuredly we shall hang separately. So that's it. It's the most dangerous idea in the world. It makes fools of all of us and we must challenge it wherever we see it. I think you might just have the seeds of your third book there, Simon. <laughs> <laughs>
Good. I think it's already there. But in the meantime, thank you so much. Um, I've, I've super enjoyed our discussion. Me too. Uh, I think anybody watching will have a whole load of new vocabulary, uh, but also new kinds of architecture in their head. And that's, that's exactly what we need. Thank you. And I'm sure we'll be speaking to you again very soon. Thank you, Andrew.